Well, good morning and welcome to our service here at Ebenezer Evangelical Church in Neath Abbey. It's Sunday the 5th of July. Um, my name is David Hales, I'm the pastor here. And this morning we're going to be looking together at the last little section of uh, Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. Uh, we're looking at 1 Thessalonians um, chapter 5 and verses 23 to 28. Um, I'm going to change things around a little bit this morning. Uh, what I'll do is I'll pray briefly first, uh, then I'm going to read a psalm. Then I'll pray again and then we'll come to look at this passage together. So let's pray as we begin. Our Father, we thank you for times like this when we can gather under the sound of your word. Lord, we thank you that even though we're distant and separate physically, we're still one together in you. And we pray, Lord, for your blessing on our time today. Speak to us, we pray. Bless your word to us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we've been going through 1 Thessalonians, one of the main themes that we've seen together is the day of the Lord, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Psalm 96 speaks of this day as well. So I'm going to read that psalm now. So Psalm 96. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvellous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendour and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendour of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad, and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. That psalm that speaks of the day of the Lord, of the, the future glory of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we see as well that we are encouraged to come and to worship the Lord. To worship the Lord in the splendour of holiness. Let's pray together. Our gracious God, we thank you for the privilege that we have the privilege of being able to gather, the privilege of being able to come to you in prayer. And Lord, we ask that you would be with us today. As we hear your word, we ask that you would make yourself known to us. Lord, may we afresh have that sense of your presence with us, your hand upon us. Oh Lord, as we have just read together. We've read of your glory, we've read of your marvellous works, we've read how you are great and greatly to be praised. And so Lord we do come and we praise you, we honour you for who you are, because you are God. In the beginning you created the heavens and the earth. You have always been, you will always be. Lord, you create all things, you sustain all things. You are mighty in power, you are strong to save. And so we thank you and we praise you. We honour you and we glorify you. But Father, we must come before you in humility this morning, acknowledging 
before you those things that we do that are not in accordance with your word when we don't live in the way that we should maybe when we worry about things that we shouldn't worry about maybe when we say or think things that we shouldn't do maybe when we doubt your power doubt your ability Lord each one of us will have things on our own hearts and in our own minds to confess to you now and so in a moment of quiet we do that we bring to you those things that we need to say sorry to you for and we ask your forgiveness for them gracious God we thank you that you love we thank you that you forgive we thank you that you have mercy and that is why we can come before you at all today because of your mercy because of your grace to us father we pray for ourselves as a church fellowship lord we thank you that uh, many of us are able to meet together on zoom to pray together <clears throat> we thank you that many of us are able to um, hear your word through the internet or even for those who receive it and listen to audio CDs Lord we thank you that still we have that technology that allows us to hear your word together Father we do pray for those maybe who don't have um, the ability to join together with others in prayer and we pray Lord that you would draw close and strengthen them Lord, may they know your touch at this time. And Father, we pray for um, churches across this land. We think into the churches in England, Lord, who many of whom may be opening up today for the first time in months. We pray, Lord, that you would give wisdom as they do that. We pray that as they do that, they would be doing so in a way that is honouring to you. And pleasing to you. Lord we acknowledge all the guidelines and the laws that we have coming from government in how to live in the light of this virus that we have among us. We pray for the government in Cardiff as they continue to plan and make decisions over the future of this country. And Lord, we pray that you would lead us as a church as we hear in due course of their plans for opening places of worship. Lord, help us to make wise decisions. Help us as we, you, you know our desire, Lord, is to, to, to gather together and worship together. But Lord, we pray that you would help us to be wise in that, to do that when it's safe to do so. Do that in a way that is helpful, that doesn't leave anyone out. But in a way that is honouring to you, to our government and to our leaders who are there because you have put them there. Our Father, help us as a church, help us as individuals to be good witnesses for you in how we live, in what we say and do. Help us to be ready to speak for you. Help us to be ready to share with others the, the love that we have for you, to share with others of your glory and of your power and of the need to praise you. And Father, at the beginning of this week of prayer for um, that the EMW have called the Evangelical Movement of Wales, we do come to you now and we pray for this land of Wales. We pray for the gospel witness in this land. And we pray, Lord, for each and every believer in this land. Father, we've been thinking over recent weeks ourselves what it is to live in the light of eternity. What it is to live a life that is pleasing to you. And Lord, we pray that 
you would help Christians in Wales to live in the light of the privilege of knowing you. Help them, each one, Lord, to experience assurance of their salvation. That knowledge, that safe, secure, certain knowledge that they are saved, that they are yours. Oh Lord, we pray that you would be building your church, that you would be growing your church, even in the face of adversity, even as we can't meet together. We pray, Lord, that you would be growing your church. Our oh, Father, we pray that you be with us. We pray that you guide and lead us. We pray that you protect us. And Father, we ask now again that you would bless your word to us as we read together from 1 Thessalonians. Be with us now, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so we turn again to 1 Thessalonians. And as I said, we're reaching the, the very end now of the, of the book, the very end of the letter of, of 1 Thessalonians. And let me read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verses 23 to 28. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all of the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. That's the passage that we're looking at together, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now if you were with us last week you will remember that we were looking last week at what it is to be a church, what it is to be a gospel church, and what that church should look like. And as we finish the letter today, as we come to these last, last few words of Paul writing to the church in Thessalonica, we continue on with that train of thought. We consider together two further aspects of the Christian life. And so as we work through this passage for our headings today, we've got um, three words that end, very loosely speaking, in shun. So three sections today, sanctification, collaboration and conclusion. As I say, a very loose connection, but sanctification, collaboration and conclusion are our three sections for today. And the first section, sanctification, is going to form the majority of what we look at together today. And I think, well, the whole letter does, but I think this section in particular gives us great encouragement. Because in this section, Paul is talking about sanctification. His prayer for the Thessalonian believers is that the God of peace would sanctify them completely. Now we mentioned sanctification briefly um, a few weeks ago when we looked at chapter 4, uh, but what is it? What is sanctification? What do we understand by that phrase? According to the dictionaries there are a number of different meanings, uh, all of which have roughly, roughly the same sense to them. It can mean to make holy, um, the word sanctify can mean to make holy to set apart, to make right with God, or to use for its proper purpose. So, what is sanctification? Well, there are two aspects to it, two aspects to sanctification. When, when Christians talk about sanctification, what we usually mean is um, the process of growing in godliness. The process of growing in godliness. Or, as I tend to say to the children, being made more like Jesus. According to um, Bishop J.C. Ryle in his book Holiness, which was, which was first written and published in the 1870s, um, according to Bishop Ryle, sanctification is that inward spiritual work which the Lord Jesus Christ works in man by the Holy Spirit when
when he calls him to be a true believer. He not only washes him from his sins in his own blood, but he also separates him from his natural love of sin and the world, puts a new principle in his heart and makes him practically godly in his life. So it should be clear from that that sanctification, or holiness if you like, should be evident in the life of every Christian. Could I even go so far as to say that if there is no evidence of being transformed, of being changed, of being made more Christ-like over time, then we may not be Christians. If that evidence is not there, then it may just be that you are not a Christian. And so each of us need to look at our own lives and reflect and think and think about how we see Jesus before we even go any further with this topic. How do you see Jesus? Is the Lord Jesus your saviour? Is the Lord Jesus your saviour? Have you asked him to forgive you and have you acknowledged him as Lord of your life? If you haven't, then it's unlikely that any of these signs of sanctification would be seen in you and in your life. So the first thing to, to think about here, now, pause, pause, pause the talk if you need to and think about it. Am I a Christian? Am I believing and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have I asked him to forgive me? Have I asked him to cleanse me? As we just thought there from, from J.C. Ryle, the first aspect of sanctification is that your sin is taken away cleansed away by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what is sanctification? Well, when the Lord, when God spoke to Moses, which is recorded for us in Exodus, the second book of the Bible, in Exodus chapter 29, um, God spoke of holiness and sanctification. The beginning, um, sorry, Exodus chapter 29 verse 42 and onwards says this there shall be a regular burnt offering throughout your generations at the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord where I will meet with you to speak with you there there I will meet with the people of Israel and it shall be sanctified by my glory I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar Aaron also and his sons I will consecrate to serve me as priests I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. So the tent of meeting was sanctified by God. It was made holy by his glory and set apart only for special uses. And that is also the same for us. As Christians, we are set apart for and by God. We're made holy by God. In fact, the Bible teaches us that God saved us in order to make us holy. In order that we be holy. In, in other words, God saved us to sanctify us. We see this, for example, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. See that? He chose us that we should be holy and blameless before him. This is the first aspect of sanctification, that we are made holy and set apart for God as soon as we are saved, as soon as we believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are sanctified, we are made holy. But who does it? Who makes us holy? Who sanctifies us? Well, as we've already seen, and uh, I think it's very clear in Scripture that it's God. God alone who can sanctify. It is only God who is holy. And so it's only God who can make 
It's not something that we can do ourselves. It is God alone who can sanctify. Um, throughout the Old Testament book of Leviticus, we read this repeated phrase, I am the Lord who sanctifies. And it's either I am the Lord who sanctifies him, or, or them, or I am the Lord who sanctifies you. But each time it's I am the Lord who sanctifies. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 3 that we considered a few weeks ago says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. It's the will of God that you be sanctified. It is God alone who can sanctify. And we need to point out too that there are not two classes of Christians. There aren't those who are holy and those who aren't. All Christians, all believers are called by God, saved by God and sanctified by God. All Christians. And that first aspect is that we are sanctified as soon as we are saved. But the second aspect of sanctification, maybe the one that we think of when we think of the word sanctification, is that we are being made more like Jesus. That we are increasing in godliness. And how does this happen? Well, Romans chapter 6, verse 22, another of Paul's letters um, says this, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. So we have the sense here that being saved, becoming a Christian, leads to sanctification, which leads to eternal life. We only have eternal life with God if we are sanctified, and we're only sanctified if we are saved if we are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now there's another uh, New Testament letter, uh, the letter to the Hebrews, then the author of this one, it's, it's, it's not agreed on as to who wrote it. Some people think it was Paul, many others think it wasn't Paul. But Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 to 14, says this, And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering... He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And so here, in this short passage in, in the book of Hebrews, we have two different angles of sanctification. Firstly, in verse 10, we see that all Christians are sanctified when they believe. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. When you become a Christian, you are sanctified. But as we read on, as we read on, we saw that in verse 14, we read, by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. So we are sanctified, but we are also being sanctified. It's something that is done, but it's also still being done. And it's a process that will continue in us until the day that the Lord Jesus returns. Um, you see it there, back now in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, you see it there in verse 23. And the second half of that verse, uh, where Paul writes, And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Which tells us, which tells us a few things. Firstly, it tells us that sanctification is about every aspect of our lives. May your whole spirit and soul and body, Paul says. It's about every aspect of our lives. It's about our thoughts. It's about our minds. It's about our hearts. It's about what we do and how we do it. The Lord will change us. The Lord will change us as he works in us to shape us and mould us. 
There's a story um, that I can take no credit for. It comes from um, Pastor uh, Paul Mallard, who tells this story. He tells of a man who carves horses from wood. Amazing horses with, with great attention to detail. And when asked how he does it, he said, it's easy. <clears throat> I look at the piece of wood until I can see the horse in it. I look at the piece of wood until I can see the horse in it, and then I cut away every bit that isn't horse. And that's how it is to be with us. Not a horse, but Christ. Our lives should be, as Christians, becoming more Christ-like all of the time. So as that, as that man carved away the bits of wood that, that weren't horse, so the Lord works in us, the, the Holy Spirit works in us to cut away all those bits of our lives that are not like Jesus Christ. And sometimes this can be hard for us. Sometimes, sometimes there can be those parts of our lives that we're reluctant to let go. But our desire has to be that we become more Christ-like, more holy, more godly. But as we heard from J.C. Ryle, it is the work of the Holy Spirit, as I've just said, it's the work of the Holy Spirit to be at work in us, to be sanctifying us. But it doesn't mean that we just let go and let God. It doesn't mean that we have nothing to do. We also need to work at our sanctification. As we read the Bible, as we pray, as we worship with other believers, as we thought about last week, God works in us. We already had that quote earlier on from J.C. Ryle that God gives us, when we become Christians, God gives us a new direction. He gives us new desires. He gives us new principles. And then he works in us through these means of grace, through the scriptures, through prayer, through worship together with others, in all of these ways, he works to make us more and more into the people that we should be. The people that we were designed to be. People in full communion with our God. We are to be holy as he is holy. But in this passage, in this verse even, we are reminded again of the future of our Lord Jesus Christ. The return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul has had this as his focus throughout the letter. You, you will know if you've been with us all the way through. At the end of each chapter. Paul comes back again and again to this topic. Chapter 1 verse 10 talks about waiting for his son from heaven. The return of the Lord Jesus. Chapter 2 verse 19 for what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming chapter 3 and verse 13 so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints chapter 4 was all about the coming of the Lord chapter 5 was about the coming of the Lord and here again at the end of the letter Paul is still talking about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ it's his constant source of encouragement of hope of comfort to the believers the Lord is coming back and it's that hope that we are to hold on and to 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 in enable us to persevere until he comes back. And Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians, and, and it can be our prayer too for each other, is that your whole spirit and soul be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. Now this doesn't in any way, in, in any way mean that we can be perfect, that we can be blameless before the Lord Jesus comes back. 
There is no way that we can be perfect before the Lord returns. But we are to be a work in progress. We are to be seeing that progress. We are to be seeing those changes. And then as long as we are still living for him, as long as we are still trusting in him at the day of our death, or at the day of his return, whichever comes first, then at that moment we will be made fully blameless and fully spotless and unblemished and fully perfect. Oh, what joy and what hope and what peace this gives us as his people. But can we be sure? Can we be sure? Well, verse 24 of our passage says that we can. It says, he who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. And, and Paul echoes this teaching in his letter to the Philippians as well. When he writes in Philippians 1 verse 6, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. When we prayed earlier on, we prayed that people in Wales, that believers in Wales would have that assurance, that confidence, that trust, knowing that they are saved, knowing that they are the Lord's. And Paul says, he who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. We can have absolute certainty in the Lord because he is faithful and because he will do what he says he will do, which is to make us increasingly holy, increasingly Christ-like, as we allow him to work in our lives. Sanctification is being set apart, made holy. It happens when we are saved, but it continues to happen. We continue to see those changes in our lives as we grow as Christians. So that was our first section this morning, sanctification. Our second section is collaboration. Three verses, verses 25 to 27, highlight for us the way that Paul is linked and links himself with the church in Thessalonica. A, a church which he planted and a church with which he wants to maintain and keep a connection. So we read, Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. And you know, when I read things like this in Paul's letters, I always find that I am comforted to read of the great apostle, the man who has planted churches, preached the gospel in so many places, seen so many people come to faith, to read of Paul asking others for prayer, always comforts me. If he needs people to pray for him, how much more do I, how much more do we? need people to pray for us. But as well as being a comfort, this verse is also an encouragement to me. It reminds me that we are not alone. We may be a small fellowship in, in one corner of South Wales, but we are not alone. It reminds me that we are to work together with others in seeing the gospel spread. We can see other examples of this in Paul's writing. If we think particularly of the um, letter to the Philippians. Um, where he makes much of their partnership in the gospel. Um, for example, Philippians chapter 1. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine for you. All making my prayer with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel. From the first day until now. And Philippians chapter 4 uh, verse 15, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel when I left Macedonia no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Paul was in partnership with the church in Philippi much as he was in partnership with the church in Thessalonica. 
And also, in his letter to Philemon, um, he writes to this man Philemon, someone who he obviously knows and who, it would appear, became a Christian through Paul's ministry. And Paul writes to Philemon to encourage him to take back his runaway slave, Onesimus. And Paul writes this in, in Philemon, verse 17, So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me, if you consider me your partner. Uh, Paul wrote to Philemon, uh, who was in Colossae, um, and he wrote that letter at some point while he was under arrest. They were miles apart physically, but they were partners in the gospel. And so for us, who can we, or who do we partner with? We can partner in prayer, and we can partner in giving with people who we know of who are missionaries. We can partner in prayer with other churches, with churches where the gospel is preached. So, as I've mentioned already, the EMW have issued a call to prayer, encouraging us to pray every day this week and to pray together with other churches and for other churches. Urging churches to be united in prayer across Wales. And so I would encourage you, if you, if you haven't already, have a look at um, EMW's website, emw.org.uk, and you can get the details for the call to prayer. And we can share together, we can partner together in prayer, as a church, but with other churches as well. But we can think more widely too about ways that maybe we can partner with churches, with evangelical gospel churches across the town of Neath or across the area of South Wales, across the nation, indeed across the world. You know, we have links already with Albania. We pray for um, Jeff and Shirley across in Canada at the moment. Many of you, I'm sure, also have your own individual links with missionaries that we can build on where we can be praying for those who are working to preach the gospel in difficult days and in different ways. But back to our passage, and Paul is writing to a specific church, and uh, as we thought of last week, we see that Paul is instructing the Thessalonians to have the letter read to all of the brothers. He wants that letter to be read to everyone in the church. It wasn't just for the leaders to read and then put down on the shelf, it was to be read to everyone. And it shows us the concern that Paul had for every member of the church in Thessalonica. He was at a distance from them, but he wanted to be remembered to them. He was concerned about them. Now you'll remember, earlier in the letter, Paul was having to defend himself against people who were saying that he didn't care about the Thessalonians. That he'd just come, planted the church and then left and gone on his merry way and wasn't bothered about them anymore. But by including this phrase here, Paul makes it clear that he does care. He is bothered, he is interested, and he wants all of the Thessalonians to hear what he has to say. He may be away from them in distance, but his concern for them hasn't changed. So it should be with us too. We may not be able to meet together, at the church, we may not be able to see each other face to face, but we are still partners together in the gospel. We can still partner together in prayer. We can still be concerned for each other. Paul not only asks for prayer, but he also asks to be remembered to the church. He sends a greeting to the church. We have it there in verse 26. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. Again, the emphasis there is on the word all. And Paul sends his greeting to everyone in the church. We don't need to get hung up or worried about the fact that he was saying to greet them with a kiss. That was just their form of greeting, much as in our pre-lockdown days we would have offered a handshake. We may have to think about what we do in the future, of how we greet people. But Paul wants all of the Thessalonians to know that he is thinking of them, to know that he is concerned about them. 
to know that he greets them. He's thinking of each and every one of them. Not just a few, but all of them. And that's his collaboration with them. He is partners with them. He wants to see them built up. He wants to see them growing in confidence and faith in God. He wants to see them trusting more and more the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to see them growing in holiness and godliness. And so we come to the end of our letter. This first letter from Paul to the Thessalonians. And we come to our conclusion. And we see the last line of the letter there. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. He's reminding the Thessalonian Christians of the grace of the Lord Jesus. The grace which is for them. It takes us back to the very beginning of the letter. Where Paul begins and starts his letter um, with these words. Paul, Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. So he begins and ends his letter with grace. The grace of the Lord Jesus. And so we're reminded that we can only be Christians. We only have the opportunity to trust in the Lord because of grace. He shows us undeserved kindness. We could just see this as a, as a way of signing off. You know how we finish our formal letters with yours sincerely or, or yours faithfully. Or, or maybe a less formal letter with lots of love. But it's not just Paul's way of signing off. It's a reminder to the believers of the bond that they have. The bond of grace. The bond that they have together in Christ. A bond that it is through his grace that they are saved. It's the bond of the gospel. But it's also a reminder. A reminder of the need for grace to be prevalent in the church. We were thinking about it last week, how we need to have peace and patience in the church. We need to show grace to each other. We need to show grace to all. <coughs> Excuse me. And so as we finish this journey through Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, what have we learned? What are the main points for us to take away with it for our lives? Because, of course, we have to remember that we're not only Christians on Sundays. It's not only as we sit and listen to the word being preached that we are Christians. What we hear now needs to affect our whole lives. It needs to affect how we live and how we think. Well, I think the key thing from this letter for us to take away is that thought, that fact of the day of the Lord, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the need to be ready. The Lord Jesus is returning and we need to be ready. The most important thing in life is for us to be ready before God. To understand that, that the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, died and rose again so that we might have eternal life. He came to show his grace. He came to take the punishment for sin, to pay the price so that we can be forgiven. But here's the thing, to be ready for the day of the Lord. To be ready to face the Lord on his return, you have to do something. It's not just enough to know those facts. You have to trust him. You have to ask him to be your Lord and your saviour. And when you do, you have that comfort, that peace, that joy of knowing that you are ready. And that you will be ready. And that he is with you. That God himself dwells within you. And will never leave you. And never forsake you. And you can live every day in the light of that peace 
and joy of being made right with God and of being sanctified and being made more right with him all the time of being made more and more like the Lord Jesus every day and knowing knowing that one day one day you will be with him forever sometimes sometimes these truths that we learn from the apostle paul are just so amazing so amazing they're almost too wonderful for us so to close in prayer i'm going to use some words that Paul wrote in another letter, in his letter to the Romans. Romans chapter 11. Let's pray these words. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counsellor? Or who has been a, given a gift to him? that he might be repaid. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us and for listening today. Um, as I've said in recent weeks, um, if you've got any questions about anything that you've heard today, please do make contact with us. Um, use, the, use the messaging on our, our Facebook page and, and get in touch. Um, I, I won't be here next week. It'll be Dr. Phil who will be, um, God willing, um, taking our time and, and preaching for us next week. Um, but for now, thank you for listening and I hope to see you again very soon.